<laughs> Great. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, thanks for uh, having me down this afternoon. It's a pleasure to be down here. And I thought Stanford weather was good, but uh, your weather is very good. So uh, it's nice to enjoy your, uh, your campus this afternoon. Um, so as you can tell a little bit from my, the, the, that introduction, my background is kind of in the probabilistic modeling and structural engineering. And I'm, I'm, I'm kind of in that field of structural reliability and, and very interested in applications to earthquake engineering and, and kind of modeling losses due to natural catastrophes. And so I'm going to talk about some of our work um, related to that field. So a little bit of probability today, but, but a little bit about more generally modeling of earthquake ground motions and, and modeling of, of uh, risk to uh, infrastructure systems. Um, so the topic we're going to we're going to talk about is again seismic risk to uh, and per today in particular to distributed infrastructure systems. Um, so systems like over on the right, there's our uh, our San Francisco Bay Area, and the the major highways are, are shown up in that in that big plot. Um, so we've got this very big geographically distributed system that's you know hundreds of kilometers in, in dimension, and uh, and that spatial extent gives us a, a lot of challenge in terms of characterizing how often are we are we going to see earthquake loading of various intensities throughout that system? Are we likely to see high loading on, on components at the same time that we're relying on to be redundant with each other? And, and might we lose them kind of redundant paths at the same time? And, uh, and they're also very complicated to, to analyze what is the impact of damage to individual components on the overall network performance. So things like transportation networks, electrical networks, water networks, all of these systems share some of those characteristics. We're going to talk mostly about transportation today. Um, and the one piece that, uh, that I'm going to talk about in, in detail because we can make some, some quantitative progress is in the ground shaking in an earthquake over this region, there, there's going to be correlation in the, in the intensity of the ground motion at multiple locations. And we can measure that in ways that haven't been measured previously and, uh, and try to study what would be the impact of those correlations on the, the performance of this network because of damage to redundant components and things like that. So that's the, the overall topic. Um, so in order to do this, we need a couple pieces, some of which is uh, available through um, other uh, you know, existing uh, literature and work. So one thing is we've got to figure out what are going to be the sources of the earthquakes uh, in our region. And over here now, I've replaced the highway network with some maps of the major faults in the region. So we've got a lot of faults, just like uh, Los Angeles, a lot of sources of earthquakes. You know, certain sources are going to affect certain parts of that infrastructure more than others. Different sources produce different size earthquakes with different rates. And in all of that, so we need to characterize where are the earthquakes coming from, how often might we, might we see them, what are going to be the, you know, the relative probabilities of large and small earthquakes. That, that mod those models all exist for pro traditional probabilistic seismic hazard analysis. Um, that's what's used to generate the, the ground motion hazard maps we use to design buildings in our building code, things like that. I understand you have Norm Abramson coming in an hour, who's really the, the world expert in this topic, and I, I'm sure he'll touch on that a little bit. So I'm going to you know, fortunately take advantage of that and, and skip talking about the, the source characterization because there's nothing really new in our work there. But we need to know that information, just keep that in mind. The next thing we need to do is we need to predict ground motion intensity given an earthquake. And so here there's, a, there's some things that you may or may not have seen. So I'm going to spend a couple minutes just for some background. Um, so, so maybe first let's look at the data. So over here we've got a plot from, from one given earthquake, this, this uh, large earthquake that occurred in Taiwan about 10 years ago. And we had a lot of instruments on the ground, so we had a lot of observations of what the, the earthquake intensity was. We're measuring intensity here, just for example, a spectral acceleration at a one second period. So how do one, one second elastic oscillators respond? And then we can plot all of our observations. Each one of these little circles is an observation from a, an instrument that was on the ground at that earthquake. And we can see how the intensity decays as we increase in distance away from, from the fault. So we see that there is this decay in distance, and we can model that using this, this heavy black line. But we also see that there's an incredible amount of scatter around that trend. You know, on, on the, the order of an order of magnitude difference from, some, say, that observation to this observation with nominally the same uh, distance. And so we don't want to just predict mean or average values of these ground motions. We want to capture that variability by putting probability distributions around this and saying, for a given earthquake magnitude, like the magnitude of this, of this Chi Chi event, and a given distance, what's the probability distribution of ground motion intensity that I might see at my site. And so the way we do that mathematically, if I come back to this uh, equation is I say, OK, the spectral acceleration at my site, and I'm going to put it logarithms on the front of everything, because this is in, in log spacing. And we see that the, the variation is nicely normally distributed if I take logarithms of everything. So the logarithm of spectral acceleration at a given period, and I just denotes a, a particular site, is a predicted mean acceleration. So that's represented by that black trend through the middle of the data. 
plus some variability around that trend, which is characterized by that distribution or the plus or minus one standard deviation lines. So we've got, these, we've got this variability that we're not able to predict just using magnitude and distance. You know, if we take into account the soil conditions and, and some other factors, we can, we can predict a little bit more of this variability, but, but there's still a very significant amount of variability that we can't predict just using simple parameters like magnitude and distance. Okay, so that variability is going to be important here. We'll keep, we'll keep thinking about that. Okay, so just to uh, circle back with our existing uh, data, if I've, got the if I've got the knowledge of the seismic sources, so all the faults and, and how often they produce earthquakes, as well as those ground motion predictions, we put those together and traditional seismic hazard analysis says, okay, sources plus these ground motion predictions give us things like hazard curves or hazard maps. That's what we can produce uh, and that's what is, is done widely already today. Now, if I want to look at risk to these distributed infrastructure systems, I've got to say, you know, uh, unlike this, this uh, single site hazard curve that tells me the probability of seeing some level of ground motion intensity, now I want to think about the ground motion intensities that might occur at multiple sites. And at first glance, I might say, well, I could just use these maps and plug in those intensities. But the problem is that this map doesn't say anything about the likelihood of uh, observing these ground motion intensities simultaneously. It's just analysis at one site at a time and then mapped up in a way that's easy to look up. So, you know, just to really push the extreme, you know, if I had some infrastructure network that ran from California out to the East Coast, I wouldn't want to design for the California ground motions and the East Coast ground motions at the same time. Those are that's separate earthquakes. And the same thing is true to, to some extent in a regional system as well. And so we'll talk about what do we need to do to, to do better than this. Okay, so, so as I just argued, the, for the lifeline systems, that, that map up top is not enough. Um, so what we want to do, you know, given that as motivation, is I want to talk to you about the spatial correlation model we need. Uh, how do we calibrate that thing? How do we measure those spatial correlations? And then we'll think about what are the implications for, for modeling the risk to these distributed infrastructure systems that could be subjected to all these different earthquakes. <coughs> okay, so, so now let's, uh, let's think about what we're going to build up here. So let's say, we'll, we'll think about our Bay Area region again. And, and just to get started, let's say I'm interested in ground motion intensity at just two sites, this site I and site J, and, and, and what's the probability of seeing strong ground motions at both of those sites simultaneously. And further, let's say that I've got, you know, I even, I'll, I'll pick an earthquake, you know, and we can do this for all possible earthquakes. So there's a given earthquake on a given fault, a given, you know, magnitude. So for those two sites, I can say the spectral acceleration at site I is the mean spectral acceleration as a function of the magnitude associated with that earthquake. The source to site distance, that's just geometry. I can compute that. The period that I'm interested in, whatever other parameters, plus some residuals. Site J, same thing. I'll compute a different mean intensity because the distance might be different to this site, but you know, and other parameters might be a little bit different. Again, I'll have some residuals. And what we're interested in is these residuals that we're characterizing that variability around the prediction. As those two sites get adjacent to each other, those residuals are going to become the same thing. As they move apart from each other, they may or may not differ, and we want to measure that and put in something that's constrained by data, because we do have data to constrain that. Do, do you have a parameter for the period you're looking at in the next 50 years or in the next so that, that's, a, that's a good question because the hazard analysis thinks about the time periods. At this stage here, we're assuming that we've, this is all given a specific earthquake, so it's given us a, a rupture. And where the time period comes in is when we talk about what's the probability of observing that earthquake with that magnitude and distance. And that's the source characterization piece, which is, it's equivalent to the, the traditional seismic hazard analysis calculation there. There's nothing new that we're doing here. So we're just saying, given an earthquake, now what do the correlations look like? And then we'll consider all possible events with their rates of occurrence, and that's when that would come into play. Okay. So we've got observations from, pa from past earthquakes, and we've, we see that those residuals are correlated. So here, I'm gonna, uh, I've got a picture, for, again, from that Chi-Chi earthquake. Each one of these points is a, is a location where we had an instrument. And I inverted that equation we were just looking at. So I, it's, before I said the spectral acceleration is the mean plus some residual. Here I'm going to say that the residual is the spectral acceleration minus my mean. Because this earthquake happened, I actually have the observed spectral acceleration values. So I'm just measuring here, if I back up a couple slides, I'm just measuring these differences between the observations and the mean values. And, and because those are the things I want to see to find the correlation in. Okay. And so these, these, these residuals here are, are shown color coded. Um, and we see that we get clusters of kind of all warm colored observations or clusters of all cool colored observations. So in, in region, in, in kind of co-located uh, sites, 
we see that we tend to see this either positive or negative residuals. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I'm, I breezed past that a little bit. So, so this is a residual term that's that's specific to a particular site. This is a residual term that's constant for the entire earthquake. And because I'm looking at just one earthquake, this this number will be a constant everywhere. So it'll just shift things by a scalar, and it, and it turns out to not play a role here. At some point, we need to simulate that because it's constant everywhere. It won't be important here. Uh, so the rupture was very big. It came along kind of up through this region here. Okay. And uh, so that plays a role in this distance measure. The distance measure we commonly use is, is the closest distance to the rupture. Mm -hmm. And so there could be a lot of locations here that have essentially zero distance to the rupture. It's a point. Yeah, okay. thank you. OK, so we've got these, these uh, observations. We see empirically that there's correlation in here. We're seeing similar values. And, and physically, that, that also makes sense, because we've got a common source earthquake. So anything peculiar to that earthquake that we're not characterizing just using magnitude, the only thing I'm using to predict here is magnitude, the total energy released. There's a lot of other you know, features of the earthquake that might cause unique um, f features in the ground motions. Um, you know, two sites that are, that are close to an asperity where a lot of energy was released might both see high uh, ground motions. Um, as the waves propagate through the crust, nearby sites are going to have the same wave propagation path that could cause kind of similarities in the intensity uh, and local side effects. So there's lots of reasons why we might expect this type of phenomenon to happen. Um, and uh, let's uh, keep going. Okay, so coming back to my, uh, my hypothetical example here with the site I and the site J, I want to know the correlation here. What I would really like to have is I would like to have, you know, 100 observations of that earthquake and the ground motion intensities at those two sites, and I could take those 100 observations and see how correlated they were just by uh, um, computing a correlation coefficient from those 100 observations. That's never going to happen. All right, if we get one set of strong ground motions at a particular pair of sites, that's kind of rare. So we've got to do, we've got to be more creative. So what we do is we make some assumptions. So I, if I, what I say is that if, if I'm trying to estimate this, the correlation for the site I and site J, I'm going to assume that, that any pair of sites with the same correlation, same distance between them, is equivalent in terms of their correlations. So, so all sites separated by 10 kilometers from each other have the same correlation coefficient. That'll let me look at all pairs of sites 10 kilometers apart to estimate that correlation coefficient. I'm also going to assume there's no orientation dependence or anything like that. We've gone back to revisit some of those assumptions, um, and there's not strong evidence for th these to be incorrect. But there's also, you know, it would be nice to have a little more data to make strong statements about this. But they appear to be reasonable uh, assumptions to, to get us going. OK, so what a, mathematically, what I'm going to say is that the correlation coefficient between epsilon at site alpha and epsilon at site alpha, where alpha is just some location, plus, a, plus an h, so some translation away from it, is a function only of the, the magnitude of h, only the, mag only the length of the separation between the two sites. So it doesn't depend on the site that I'm looking at, and it doesn't depend on, on any sort of changes in orientation. This is a value ground. Yes, absolutely. I think I've got. That text, that text is coming in, in two slides. It's, this is, yeah, so this variogram technique is it's coming from the field of geostatistics. Um, and it's used a lot in petroleum engineering, where you, you drill down a couple times, or in mining. You, you've got a couple uh, places where you've drilled down and you've observed presence or absence of minerals or oil. And you're trying to infer in between what's going on. And so they've developed all this mathematical uh, framework. And we're just borrowing it for, for this problem here. Um, we're also borrowing some of their software that helps to process this data. OK, so with those assumptions now, what I'll do is I'll take all those epsilons from, say, this earthquake, and I'll find all of the pairs of locations that have a given separation distance, plus or minus some small tolerance. And that'll give me a whole bunch of observations of, of epsilon separated by some distance. Then I can take the, you know, the epsilon 1 and the epsilon 2, and I can plot them against each other. And I can see you know, if, if one of the ends of that arrow has a high epsilon, does the other end of that arrow have a high epsilon as well? And so I'll get a whole bunch of observations, and I can compute a correlation coefficient out of this, or a semi-covariance to be a little more precise. But they're they're basically equivalent for our purposes. Okay. So at that separation distance, I've got some correlation. If I increase the separation distance, I'll find a new set of pairs of sites, and I'll re-estimate a new correlation coefficient. Okay. So then we turn all those observations into this semi-covariance, and it says each one of these red X's is a correlation coefficient obtained from this type of data with that specified separation distance. So we come along at all these different separation distances, compute all of these, basically 1 minus correlation coefficients. Do you see a nugget? You know, some kind 
yeah, so, that, so the, the nugget means that this thing doesn't always go to zero, or, or the, equivalent of the correlation coefficient doesn't go to one. Um, we don't seem to see it, although we're not all that well constrained with the very closely separated uh, sites. Um, but as, as you get down to 100 meters station spacing, you see pretty much the same epsilons, uh, typically. So we don't, we don't see one. But we do see this uh, kind of a very sharp rise. So these things, it's, a, it's not a, like a differentiable process, I guess. But the nuggets will come maybe if you have like uh, errors and the measurement, systematic errors. And so in other words, you yeah. cannot go down to zero. You have to, the instrument is at some kind of level of performance. Mm -hmm. so yeah, we, we don't have strong data to, to constrain it, but the trend certainly suggests that we're getting close to a, a zero intercept. Um, okay, so, I, so those repeated analyses gave me all those red uh, Xs, and then what I'd like to do to turn that into a predictive model to make forward predictions is we're going we're gonna to come up with an equation uh, that looks something like this. So 1 minus the correlation coefficient is what I've got plotted over there. And, and here that, that solid black line is an exponentially decaying model. So it says that the correlations decay exponentially with distance, or H is, again, that distance measure. And then we've got this little A parameter. Um, which is a, what we call the correlation range. So A is, is telling us how fast this thing decays. And, and that, that A parameter corresponds to how far out in distance do you get before you basically have no correlation left uh, between your sites, or 5% or correlation. I'm very curious, did you see any kind of anisotropy in your semi-diagram? Because you have your faults, and it should define some anisotropy. You're using an anisotropic assumption. Yep. We have gone back, so that, so that just to, uh, Catch people up. So the so the idea might be that, well, the correlations with distance in this direction might decay at a different rate than the correlations with distance in this direction if the fault is, is moving that way. Um, we didn't see any evidence for it, but we don't have a great data set for for pulling that out. It's also especially with this very complicated rupture, it's hard to define the, the two directions you want to look. Um, and the typical uh, way to test for anisotropy is um, to specify kind of principal axes. But really, we might want like a radial direction versus a parallel direction. And the geometry to compute that is a little messier. So uh, we didn't see anything, but I'm not sure if it's just because we're not looking in a clever enough way or if we don't have enough data. Um, and I think this is a place where simulated ground motions constrain us a little bit better um, because we can simulate ground motions in very dense arrays. Um, but that's, a, that's something you we're still working on. Separate for horizontal motion, vertical motion? We've looked only at horizontal motion so far. Um, we haven't looked at verticals. Um, because we haven't had a need for them yet, but, but we could repeat the whole process with verticals as well. Your, your detection then set is A equals zero. The two observations are identical. Yeah. So at zero, that would have to be the case because it's just the same observation. The question is if you move to 100 meters or something, might there be a jump or would it be a continuous kind of because change? Two buildings next to each other, one can have very bad damage, one can have no damage. Well, that, that may be due to the... Yeah, so the soil conditions could have an impact. Uh, that's, that's true. Or, but uh, you know, then we would need kind of abrupt changes in soil conditions, and, and we'd have to measure that in a way that we could predict. Which sure. Right now, the whole thing is different from the uh, yeah, 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 something along that. So you're finding some, uh, some things to continue studying, but uh, you know, Data, data constraints pre prevent us from going too far with this. But th you know, those are good things to be keeping in mind as potential limitations here. Okay, um, so we've got this model now to predict correlations. What, so, so if this is the functional form that's going to work, what we can see is that out of, all, out of all those repeated analyses at all those different distances, the only thing that I need in order to use this equation is that A number. I just need to know what the range is, and then I've completely specified how the correlations change with distance. And so here's a picture of that range as a function of the spectral acceleration period. So we repeat the whole thing for spectral accelerations of different periods from, the, from those sets of ground motions. And here's a couple well-recorded earthquakes um, to see what those ranges look like. So what this is saying is that at the short periods, we've got a little bit of a discrepancy here. You know, we could pick something around two seconds, things are similar. So spectral accelerations at two seconds, by distances of 30 or 40 kilometers, you essentially see no correlation in these residuals. Less than 30 kilometers, you're gonna see some sort of correlation uh, in uh, residuals at two different sites. As you go to longer periods, you see that the, the correlations extend over a longer range. This is the same trend we see with, say, ground motion coherence. Um, it, this, again, fits physically. Longer period ground motions have 
longer wavelengths, they're sensitive to kind of features in the, in the crust at, at larger scales, and it would make sense that their correlations would, would maybe propagate over b bigger distances. Yeah, we, uh, let me pull up a few more data points here to help answer that. So we've, we picked uh, seven pretty well recorded earthquakes uh, to, to repeat all these analyses at it, and so those lines are all superimposed. So the Chi-Chi was uh, in here with no symbols on it, I guess. We found the Anza earthquake, at least, we bumped even a little bit higher than that. We seem to see um, kind of a bit of a bifurcation here at the short periods that seem to be dependent somewhat on heterogeneities in the soil conditions. So that I if you were in basins or places with very homogeneous soil conditions, you tended to see higher correlations uh, in that um, either due to the soil effects having kind of the same impact on the ground motions at all locations, increasing correlations, or um, due to the, predic the predictive model being unable to predict whatever phenomenon was going on at all of those homogeneous sites. Either way, we were kind of kicking up the correlations. It seemed like they're we're not sure that that's the physical explanation, but that seemed to be the empirical trend that the homogeneity in site. And I don't know if I brought the slides or not. No, I left them out. I have some more slides I can, I can show you, but I wasn't sure if the structural engineering crowd was was uh, excited for too many slides of soil conditions things. But uh, so what, what the, uh, the takeaway is from this is we see s certainly some variation, some of which could just be sample size uh, sampling issues, some of which you know, we think there may be physical explanations for. We've yet to find strong trends with earthquake magnitude or with uh, you know, directionality or anything like that that would explain it. But uh, we're keeping an eye out for, for things as we look at some simulations as well. We do definitely see an uh, increasing trend with period in all of these, and then uh, this little bit of a bifurcation at these short periods. Um, and so we fit some sort of a, 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 a overall predictive model based on all of this data. And so we think we've got a you know, reasonably empirically constrained model for how these correlations change with distance. Um, I should mention there are some previous results along these lines. Um, so I took a picture from uh, Dave Bohr. Uh, from a few years ago where he was looking at the Northridge uh, data mostly, um, and he had pulled in some observations from, uh, from other events. This has got a lot of different data superimposed on it, and, and we won't go into where it came from, but they were trying to pull up any sorts of, you know, something similar to, a, to the, the variogram we were looking at. Um, so all of the black ink was, was observations and, and the functional fit that they had, and then this red line is our, our model, so it kind of falls in line with, with what had been done previously. We looked at a much bigger data set, we also looked at a much wider range of ground motion parameters. So this had primarily been done just for peak ground accelerations previously, and we've looked at spectral accelerations over a range of periods. And we also think we have a little bit more of a, of a physical explanation for some of the variations that we see. So, uh, so this isn't you know, completely new, but, but some of the data analysis and data sets are, are new uh, from what had been done previously. Okay, so that's the, the stop of our data fitting. Now let's use this for predicting some losses. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna do it all in reverse. And I'm going to say, I'd like to know something about the spectral accelerations at all of my different sites. And I'm going to use that same model again. So what we'll do is we'll put together the pieces. So the first thing is the mean log spectral accelerations that we just predict as a function of distance. So coming over here, now I'm going to pick this big San Andreas rupture through the Bay Area. And this is color-coded uh, mean log spectral accelerations. And then I just put an exponential in the front to get it back to some units that are meaningful. So we see the, the ground motions decreasing with with distance away from the fault. There also is uh, some corrections for soil conditions uh, here as well. This is a Bohr and Atkinson uh, NGA ground motion model for those of you that are interested in that. Okay, so this is our mean predictions, first term. Second term is those residuals. They're spatially correlated. So now I'm simulating vari that, the variation around the mean prediction, but doing it in a way that's spatially correlated in, in agreement with what we just measured from all those past earthquakes. So we see if this thing had no spatial correlation in it, this would just be white noise, like what you used to see on your TV with static, you know, before we had satellite TV, now we just get the blue screen. You know, what we see here is we see this blotchy pattern that's capturing that spatial correlation. So nearby sites have the same or similar epsilon values. As the separation distance gets bigger, we lose that correlation and, and we get this variability. Okay? So this variability is no longer related to the earthquake at all. It's just whatever we couldn't predict using this model. And, and so we're, we're just throwing this variability into our mean prediction We'll put those together, we'll simulate that, that final site term, or, or uh, event term, which is just a constant everywhere. And then we get a simulation of, of spectral accelerations, which has mean values in accordance with our predictive model, and has variability that's in accordance with our predictive models, and spatial correlation in accordance with what we just observed. 
Um, the, the Krieging would, would be just the interpolations. So we're actually simulating the variability as well. Um, so we're using the, the Krieging equations to come up with distributions at, at everywhere. Yeah, so the same, same math of Krieging. Okay, so um, unlike, so this is, this is kind of comparable to hazard analysis where we, we, simulate, we, you know, we consider all of our different magnitudes and distances and then consider the distribution of ground motion intensity. I can't do kind of analytical equations like I do with hazard analysis. All I can do is, is just do Monte Carlo simulations of this because I can't, I, I can't really do numerical integration over all of these multiple sites. Uh, the math breaks down. So, so, but what I can do is I can, I can do this kind of simulation for, uh, for as many earthquakes as I want and I'll just simulate those earthquakes in accordance with the source models. No, so this, this term here is, is by definition things that we couldn't predict. So if, 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 we had a, if we had some idea how the geology played a role, it should go into here. This is the term that we can predict. So we can say, I know how on average ground motions vary as a function of geology. So there is a, there is a term as, as a function of VS30 in here. So if you told me, you know, oh, I've got a, I got a basin effect term, then I would say, well, we'll put it in here. Don't put it in the, the residual. So this is just prediction error. Um, so just uh, you know, s variability in, in uh, um, the source and, and variability in the wave propagation and things like that that we're not able to predict using kind of our simple predictor models. Uh, when you said that color quota, it means the red color means it's strong. Yeah. And the green means it's weaker. Yeah. Yeah. So so if along that line, yeah. Here. So this is strong. Yeah. So this black line is my rupture. Total rupture. Yep. I could do this for a, for a small rupture as well. I'll sh I think actually maybe the next slide. It's more like a, not like a source pond then. Yeah, so here is a, a continuous line rupture, the whole fault. Yeah, yeah, we want the spatial extent of these things. And that's consistent with, with probabilistic seismic hazard analysis, the same thing there. So here I don't have the, the full, all the stuff spelled out, but here's the final model. So I think this is the one we were just looking at where we've got the red kind of all along the San Andreas. So here's a, here's a southern segment, or I guess that's northern segment, Hayward rupture. Um, here's some smaller event and, and some southern segment Hayward rupture. So, so the, the intense ground motion are going to depend on which, you know, where the rupture was, and, and that should vary in size in accordance with things. Okay, so what, so what we'll do is we'll, we'll simulate all of these different earthquakes in proportion to how often we think they'll occur. We'll simulate all the ground motions variability, you know, given those occurrence of those earthquakes. And then at any particular site, I've got a whole bunch of simulations of what the ground motion intensity might be equipped. And along with it, I've got the ground motion intensities at all my other sites. And just to double check ourselves, I could pick a particular site in here. I could count up how many times exceeded a given spectral acceleration threshold, and I could plot that. So plotted in red here is implied by all these simulations over the years. Um, the annual rate of exceeding various levels of spectral acceleration at, at some period. I didn't, I didn't label the period. So the red line is just counting up how often we exceed them on those maps. The line is a numerical integration from seismic hazard analysis um, using the same source model. So we're getting out ground motions with exactly the same frequencies that we would have gotten through our seismic hazard analysis, which is used to build those seismic hazard maps. And, and so we, um, we, can, uh, we can call this hazard consistency. We're consistent with, with previous hazard calculations. That was a term actually coined by uh, Jim Moore here and uh, Masanobu Shinazuka, who did some similar work uh, previously on this topic. Okay, so now that we've got all these simulations, let's use them in a lifeline loss assessment. Okay, and so the, the assessment we're going to take a look at is we're going to go back to that Bay Area, uh, just the interstate highways, and we're going to compute uh, travel time delays due to bridge damage caused by earthquakes. Um, so we've got, uh, from Caltrans, we've got um, information about the whole network, the capacity of all the different links, what types of bridges are in here, and how much demand is on each one of those links. How many people want to get from point A to point B uh, for all different uh, locations. Caltrans had this at a, at a higher resolution. We've aggregated it down to just the highway networks, um, just for illustration. Then we've got to predict bridge damage as a function of the ground motion intensity. So here we're using um, hazardous fragility functions just to have some reference uh, predictive models of damage as a function of ground motion intensity. And then we use a user equilibrium model to say um, how long is it going to take to get from point A to point B after bridges are damaged. Uh, assuming everybody wants to uh, go from point A to point B just like they did before the earthquake. So we don't have any sort of uh, changes in travel demand in here caused by the earthquake. We're just saying 
let's assume we've got exactly the same demand as beforehand, but now we have damaged bridges that reduce our network capacity. Uh, so, uh, so that's our model. So this is a, it's simplified in all of these different ways. It's, it's, it's not um, representing the real network, but it has um, a lot of the features of distributed networks that are difficult to handle, like the interaction between the different uh, links. It's got all of this, you know, we're, we're studying the performance of the network in terms of getting people from point A to point B rather than just counting how many bridges are damaged. So it's a more explicit characterization of, of is this network doing what we want it to do? Um, the numbers aren't quite right because of these aggregations, but we're using it to try to illustrate how this, this technique would work. And, and we're going to need to analyze it a lot of times in some benchmarking cases, and so we wanted a, a little bit simpler network to study. Okay, so that's a quick, quick overview of what the... Uh, this. Okay, so now coming back to these maps, for each one of these maps, we'll apply those ground motions to our highway network. We'll predict the bridge damage at the locations. That I didn't mention it, but I think there are um, a thousand bridges in that highway network, something like that. So we're using hazardous fragility functions that just tell me the probability of damaging each one of those thousand bridges as a function of the thousand ground motion intensities. And then for each one of these maps, we'll simulate down how much did the travel time change on, on each link using that user equilibrium model. And then we'll count up what was the cumulative extra travel time delay in, in a given hour of operation of this network. And we can do this type of simulation for each one of those maps. And then we add up how, mu how much travel time delay we had in each one of those simulations, count how many times we exceed some level of travel time delay, and we get a map that looks like this. So now we've got what we call this loss exceedance curve for increasing levels of travel time delay along the bottom. What's the annual rate we might obs observe that amount of delay in this network because of ground motion shaking. Okay, so now I can actually put probabilities to, you know, the, the possibility of, of some level of severe network disruption. Okay, now here's a few more simulations of those network delays, color-coded again, just to uh, kind of see how this thing is working for different, different ground motion simulations. Okay, one challenge with this is that I've just got, I just said, you know, with probability 10 to the minus 4, you'll see 20,000 hours of travel time delay. But it doesn't tell you kind of what was the causal event. And one thing that we've, we've heard is that the, the people who own these networks would like to have kind of a scenario for scenario planning. So what we can do is we can go back and say, you know, given that I had some level of disruption, what was the most likely event to have caused it? So we can do some of this, you know, all of the different events, you know, how much are they contributing to various levels of loss exceedance? And this is deaggregation, just like seismic hazard deaggregation for those of you that have seen this. So now we can look for, for kind of various levels of, of travel time delay. Here's a plot of kind of four of the major faults in the Bay Area and, and then magnitudes of earthquakes. Um, and so we see that, you know, for the 5,000 hour travel time delay, we've got lots of contribution from uh, magnitude 7 Hayward fault. So that's, a, that's an event that's used a lot in kind of deterministic planning in our region. As we move up to bigger travel time delays, now we shift over to seeing that it's the San Andreas fault magnitude 8. So that's that full fault rupture that we were uh, looking at earlier. So this is, that's the only event that's big enough to cause this much travel time delay, even though it's rarer. If I move down to delays of zero hours, now we're, you know, this is very minor disruptions, and we're driven by kind of small magnitude frequent events. So depending on how severe of a disruption you're looking at, the, the trade-off between the frequency of the event and the consequences that, that event incurs kind of interact in, in a way that we can kind of, we can see using these types of plots. So we think this is helpful in, in identifying scenario events to be studying. Okay, another thing that we can look at here is how much difference did that spatial correlation really make? So remember when we were making these simulations, we were, we were having spatial correlations in the ground motions to say, you know, nearby sites have either both have high ground motions or low ground motions relative to the mean. I can repeat that whole simulation in a couple different ways. So, th so this top blue line was the case that we just looked at, spatial correlations considered. I could neglect the spatial correlations so I could simulate just white noise variability around those predictions up here and, and say, you know, adjacent sites don't have any correlation. I could see what would happen. And we see that the rates of exceeding our travel time delays decrease. The reason this is happening, even though we've got the same variability in there, is that now we're less likely to disrupt two redundant paths at the same time. So, you know, I'll knock, off, I'll knock out one bridge and then the, highway, the next highway over, that bridge might be fine because I didn't account for the spatial correlation in the loading that might have ha caused both bridges to have large ground motions at the same time. And so the, uh, the impact of, uh, of those redundant paths and things is, is important uh, in terms of these spatial correlations. And, and, and I think this is probably basically state of the art at this point, that those spatial correlations aren't really considered. 
Another thing that's done is that we just sometimes will just completely ignore the ground motion variability. So we don't even have all that, that splotchy color coding here. We just say the spectral accelerations are the mean spectral accelerations. Let's not worry about that variability. Now that's, that's really tough to justify because we observe a, a great deal of variability in recorded events. Uh, that really knocks down our rates of exceeding travel time delays because we never predict larger than average ground motions. Sure. What would happen in your, when you neglect the variability, you are taking the average uh, attenuation curve. What if you were to take plus one sigma hour? Uh, how would this new uh, average, or mean increased average, will shift your curve? Yeah. Uh, you yeah, I mean? so that's another possibility that, that, that is sometimes used to say, well, let's just take the mean and then let's just add like add a one over here one standard deviation larger. So that will that'll bring this whole curve up a bit, but it'll, it'll bring it up at the left side as well as the right side. And it, it's, you, you can get yourself in the neighborhood of the, of the right answer, but it's hard to tell ahead of time that you've really positioned yourself uh, properly. I, I think it's... it's yeah. And my next question is, how does the scale of the network interact with the scale of the range? That's a, that's a pretty important feature, um, I think. And in particular, the kind of scale of redundant paths relative to that, that scale of that range. Um, I think it's, it's very important, and it's something that we haven't explored in a lot of detail yet. This is the only network we've studied in detail so far, so I don't, I don't have a good feel for what's going to happen there. But it's, I'm certain that it's important. Yeah. Okay, so, so a big takeaway here was that the spatial correlations, although they take a little bit more effort to get in there, they really have a big impact, particularly on those, those large tail losses, um, and, and that, that arguably there's, there's situations where we want to get those into our analyses um, if we're going to try to make decisions about you know, retrofits and upgrades and thinking about spending money now to, to prevent these losses. We've got to potentially uh, consider those spatial correlations. Um, uh, I'll, I'll speed up through a couple slides. So one thing that's a, that's a challenge here is that there are so many earthquake sources, so many of these simulations, in order to get a a good prediction out to these very small annual rates of exceedance, I've got to do these simulations lots and lots of times, um, potentially into the millions of times. So that's insurance companies that do this for portfolios of buildings will do millions of simulations. Um, and that's potentially a, a big problem if our network models are expensive to analyze, which is typically the case. And so another thing we've been thinking about is how can we make this analysis more efficient? Because we like the answers, but the getting there is impractical. So a couple things that we're looking at is, is you know, this is Monte Carlo simulation, what I've told you so far. We are looking at uh, preferentially simulating what we call interesting events, is important sampling. And so the idea there is that um, my source model tells me that I get lots and lots of magnitude five events, a few magnitude six events, and very rare magnitude seven and eight events. I'm probably interested in the magnitude sevens and eights because that's gonna cause my severe disruption but I don't want to completely ignore them. They happen very frequently and they might cause some disruption. So can I, s I want to simulate the magnitude sevens and eights more frequently and the magnitude fives less frequently, but, but not you know, screw up my, my later analysis. The other thing that we're thinking about is saying that out of these millions of maps, lots of those maps look pretty similar to each other. And so reanalyzing my network over and over again for a bunch of maps that look similar is, is a waste of resources as well. If I can cluster some similar maps, um, then, then that can save me some time. And let me give you just a, a minute on each one of those techniques. So the idea is that with basic Monte Carlo sampling, so here's our, here's our equation that we've seen lots and lots of times today. The mean spectral accelerations, those are a function of magnitude. And, and for a typical source, this is something that, this is like the probability distribution of the magnitudes. So as the magnitudes get bigger, we've got this exponential decay. That's Gutenberg-Richter law. And then maybe we've got a little bump out at a characteristic earthquake magnitude. So where I'm going to end up with lots of simulations over here if I'm just simulating in accordance with this probability distribution. What we do instead with important sampling is I say, well, I really am interested in that, that right tail over there. So I'm going to simulate from a different distribution. And we're actually using a permutation called stratified sampling, which is I'm going to take one simulation out of each one of these little discretized cells, and I'm going to discretize more finely up where I'm interested and more coarsely where I'm less interested, so I get more samples from up here. Then, to account for the fact that I'm sampling from a different distribution than I actually want, we put what we call an important sampling weight, where we reweight those things back. And I say, well, I only took one sample from here, even though I was supposed to get a lot of samples, so I'll, I'll weight that one sample higher, and then I'll downweight these ones, because I took too many samples, 
but I've got better resolution now. Uh, and so I can keep track of all my probabilities appropriately. So that's the important sampling. The other thing we're, we're doing is, is k-means clustering. And so what we do is, here, I've only got four maps, but uh, it works better even if, if you've got more maps, is to say, well, maybe these two maps, I'm going to say those look kind of similar to each other. So let's take these two, we'll put them into a, a single cluster, and I'll only take one map out of that cluster rather than analyzing my network under both maps. And my one map will stand in for both of the previous maps, and so it'll get all the probability associated with the previous maps. Um, and, and that can save us a bunch of time if I, if I cluster down a big number of maps into a smaller number of maps. Um, so just one results slide here. So our, our basic analysis, if I did Monte Carlo for everything, is on the order of a million simulations, and we, we really can't handle that very well. So here we, we, we immediately go to, Monte, uh, to important sampling for our magnitudes. Um, but Monte Carlo sampling for those residuals. And, and so with 125,000 maps, we get the, the, the plot that I had shown you previously. If I then go to important sampling for the magnitudes as well as the residuals, which I didn't talk to you about, those, those epsilons, we can important sample on those too. I can cut down another order of magnitude and get the red line, I believe, which is basically on top of the old one. Then if I cluster these, these 12,000 maps into just 150 maps, I can, and I, I, can, I can get pretty much the same thing. We repeated this a whole bunch of times because it's very easy to do 100 maps analyses with 150 maps. So just to give you an idea of the variability, there's a whole bunch of light gray lines obtained from different sets of 150 maps. And, and there's certainly some variability, but you know, depending on how far out we want to go and how much accuracy we need, you know, cutting our analysis time by orders of magnitude is, is maybe worth the trade-off in, in getting a little bit more variability here. So, but, but the other thing to notice is even though there's some variability, on average we're laying right on top of the, the more detailed answer. So we're not, we're not pulling this curve up and down by by doing any of these more efficient techniques. Okay, so uh, those are just a few thoughts to, to, to leave you with. So some of the major points is that, you know, we started out by using those earthquakes, the well-recorded earthquakes, and we measured those spatial correlations in those residuals and saw, you know, at what distances are the spatial correlations in the ground motion intensities dying down. And we've got more detailed empirical evidence than we had before. Then using those spatial correlations, we did the simulations of those ground motion maps. And you could think about that as kind of a generalization of, of probabilistic seismic hazard analysis for a single site. So now we've got the characteristics of, you know, in future earthquakes, what is the distribution of, of ground motion intensities at multiple sites? Then using that, um, we're, uh, you know, we're, we're plugging in those simulations into our, our highway network model and, tr and understanding kind of how much, uh, how does those correlations uh, affect the losses to our distributed infrastructure systems? And then we're continuing to look at um, how can we make this analysis more efficient and, and reduce the, a pretty significant computational burden to do this type of analysis. Um, so then just to, to leave you with this, uh, if you're interested in some more details, we've got some papers and, uh, on their way to uh, getting published and some reports. And all these documents are available at, at my website. So anybody who wants to read a little bit more, uh, there's more than you uh, could probably handle at, the, at that website. All right. So with that, I'll close. Thank you for your time this afternoon. Thank you, Jan. I'm sure uh, Professor Baker will entertain a few questions. Sure. I have, yes. Just a quick question on those bridges that you were mentioning. Yeah. The failure and the probability of failure for that. Did you consider the failure of the bridges, the model that Taplan provided you, based on the collapse of these bridges? Because depending on what kind of damage you're talking about, that may have also an impact on delay hours and what do you mean by ultimately? Yeah, yeah. I, uh, <laughs> I, I skipped through a lot of detail on this part, so I, I, that's a, thank you for bringing that back up. So um, the bridge damage is, it falls into these hazard states, so minor, moderate, major collapse damage states, um, which are kind of loosely defined. And uh, I, I guess, and, and then what we've got is for each one of those damage states, we've got some reduction in the, in the capacity of the, of the highway that crosses over that bridge from, you know, 20% reductions up to very significant reductions for major damage. A couple other things I'll mention as long as you got me on that. This, this, uh, these bridge damage is only a function of the ground shaking spectral acceleration, so there's no abutment failures or, or technical failures or anything like that. Also, the, the kind of the big signature bridges don't, you know, the Bay Bridge, you can't make predictions using these types of models, so we just kind of plug some numbers there, and, and so we're, we're inaccurate in those respects, but that's what we did to be able to form. I have a question, Jack. Uh, the fragility curves usually uh, depend on the type of bridges. If it's a single span versus no span. Yep. Um, and uh, you have different flexibilities on those bridges. 
one of a short period, one long period. Now, yeah. if I take your analysis and, and I kind of draw a conclusion of it, it will say that if I have a lot, since your range is for, for you have long period, right? You have a long range. That's mean if my systems include very soft bridges, I would have more delay. You for that's okay. <laughs> I yeah. Think about that. Yeah, you I think that's fair to say. Mm -hmm. Especially if your curve, your diagram, is as you showed, is coming up, this coming yep. down this way, going this way. Yep. So soft infrastructure, I mean flexible infrastructure, would be subjected to delay. That you the you infrastructure is all made of monolithic bridges. Uh, you follow me? Potentially, I'm so I'm multiple. I'm jumping a few. Yeah, I think that's. But I think that's fair to say. Uh -huh. Yeah. And I'm surprised I with this conclusion. <coughs> well, it's outcome, outcome or, or infrastructures. Flexibility can be related to the damage. Well, it's. I guess. It's a very interesting conclusion of your analysis. I, I think. Yeah. I don't know if you follow me. It's a bit of a okay. So what I maybe if I, if I can think that through quickly, and I may I may be getting something wrong is. So if we had two, two, two bridges that were maybe redundant paths to get from where you wanted to, to get to where you wanted to get to, if they were both flexible, so they were both sensitive to long period ground motion, those ground, long period ground motions are going to more, be more correlated than if they were both stiff, uh, you, would, you would have a little bit less correlation. So, so you would be more likely to lose both bridges in the same earthquake. That assumes that mm -hmm. the probability of damage of the bridges is the same in both cases. In a, so, so, so given the same probabilities of damage, you're, you might either lose both or lose neither if they were long period. Now, I, I don't know if that's kind of the first order controlling feature or if it's just the probabilities of damage that is, that's more important and this correlation is kind of a secondary feature. Um, but it's a potential, yeah, Im implication. I think that's very interesting. Yeah. Uh, what is the uh, baby bridge uh, is that the one that you mentioned about at the very beginning? Uh, there is nothing to do with an earthquake. I think it's just failure of the tendon. I don't know very much. Uh, yeah. Can we have yeah. uh, pictures here? Is it still uh, up? OK. This seems to be that's on the website. You can check on oal.news. It seems like it's a temporary uh, cable, a tendon, right? It looks like a tendon to me, yeah. which was to support these structural elements which seems to have snapped. And apparently uh, 5,000 pounds of steel fell on the deck. That you can read more about that. Because uh, I've just read it myself, so I, I send you to the, to the, uh, to the source. Now, if you, you can go on the news now, and you can make declarations. They're looking for people, experts. Yeah. So as you walk <laughs> the room, you'll be as good experts as anybody else. Yeah. OK? So it's nothing to do with ground motion. But it might be a result of the previous uh, denial earthquakes. We don't know. Yeah. And I guess maybe to try to you know, put that back into context with what we were just talking about with these fragility functions and things, what we're really thinking about here is you know, there are some, some signature bridges that, that need a lot of very detailed analysis. And, and clearly, we're doing some very crude analysis here. This type of approach works really well for not the three signature bridges, but the 997 overpasses that are single span, two span bridges. Um, and that's where we really have a challenge, and that we've got thousands of these bridges all over the place. And if you just look at that network and, and you ask, which ones, which ones do I need to f upgrade first? Which ones are the most critical ones for this system to be performing? Well, you could find the ones most likely to be damaged, but those might not be the most you know, used ones. You could find the ones carrying the most traffic now, but that doesn't account for you know, are there redundancies? You know, are there, is there a bridge next door that works well? And so it's really those, those small ones where this network I interaction is very difficult to capture, and you need to do some kind of quick, you know, rapid analyses here in order to try to identify which bridges are critical for the, for the performance of the system, which is where we're, we're heading with this. For the Bay Bridge and the Golden Gate Bridge and these, these big signature ones, we're, we're doing a you know, very broad brush strokes here. This isn't the, the approach for thinking about those. But, but there are other problems with bridges that are challenging and, and can be well addressed by this type of approach. By the way, Jack, we're doing something similar with G more for the for the area and the yeah, Jim Moore is a leader in this in this type of a calculation.
So uh, before we conclude, uh, I'd like to say that we have another seminar uh, taking place at USC. It's for organized by EERI. And uh, Norm Abramson from PG&E will be actually talking uh, in uh, Science Hall, right? Yes. And we'll be talking at 3 o'clock. Uh, at 4. At 4 to 5 on the next generation uh, ground motion, strong ground motion. So you're all welcome to attend. So today is a day of strong ground motion. <laughs> okay, we have two experts uh, coming to us from the Bay Area, and we are very honored to have them here. Now, if we don't have any more questions from the audience, I think we should again thank Jack for an excellent seminar. Thank you. 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 Thank you.